I I like it. Wow, so I we like we found out what percentage of the total number of songs. Um, we did five. Yeah, out of two hundred. Out of about two hundred, so that's two two point five percent. Yeah, it's not bad. That's not bad in in one go. That's great, actually. Yeah. Super fun. Yeah. Yeah, I had a blast. I had a blast. It's it's uh oh I'm gonna stop recording now. Omen. Nick. What are we listening to today? Um I would like for you to talk tall to me about Serenade to a Cuckoo. Serenade to a Cuckoo. Uh, It's actually a cover version of Roland Kirk's it's apparently a standard of his. Um, yeah. In the liner notes to the album, it says that Cuckoo was actually one of the first tunes that Anderson learned to play on the flute. Um, I, I'm assuming taught himself to play on the flute. I would imagine, yeah. I, yeah. And I think it's, you know, it's, I think it's easy to see why Ian Anderson might be inspired by Roland Kirk. I mean, um, so Kirk was a, a little bit of the previous generation. He was... Um, he was born in 1935, so that would put him, that would make him of <clears throat> the, the generation of musicians before Ian Anderson, somebody that Ian Anderson could look up to. He was American, um, and he was known on stage for his vitality, his improvisation, and his multi-instrumentalizationism. Yeah, I'm, I will, uh, <laughs> I'll throw the... I'll throw a link to the video that that we watched um, in the show notes. Yeah, so you can see and like it is like I said earlier. I think it was in the the first episode. Like you can hear Ian Anderson in Kirk's playing. Like it is, it is, it's it's remarkable, and it's not a surprise that he um, he was such an inspiration. Absolutely, or if 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 even not necessarily an inspiration, but a someone who influenced him enough to learn the flute and play like that. Oh, I think he was totally in, in, uh, an inspiration on a lot of levels. I mean, like one thing that's so clear watching Kirk perform in that, in that video, and I would love to see more, but is just his, his in the momentness with the music and his mm-hmm. connection to the audience. Um, all of th- all of which are things that I think Ian Anderson strived for and probably never really achieved in the same way that Kirk did. But, you know, of course, maybe early shows in smaller, a smaller venue thing. Maybe so. Yeah. So what do you think about Tull's version of Serenade? You know, it's interesting to note that he he plays it. um, It's, it's quite down tempo. And I suspect that that might possibly be because his technical skill on the flute just wasn't up to, par to be able to play it so fast and with Kurt's version I mean it's so intricate there's stuff that that Ian Anderson couldn't do as, as, at this point at least even if it was slower so I think that to a certain extent you know I, I suspect that, that was part of it um you know it's got in some ways I feel like it's a tribute and you know and it's funny I I sort of have a I love this recording I I, I enjoy listening to this recording I don't think it's the best example of Ian Anderson's flute playing. No, definitely not. I don't think it's the best example of, of this lineup of musicians playing together. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that uh, Mick Abrams is, does a great job with the sort of jazz chords, but it's, it feels a little, um, uh, what, did they, what did they used to say in Paris? Uh, scolaire. It feels a little bit scolaire. It feels a little bit scholarly, like mm. we have learned this and we are doing it. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't feel um, like I, I, I appreciate the wanting to, to do the honor 
to right. to Kirk to play it. But it, it it does feel like they're going through the motions. It does not feel there's there's there the there's no passion imbued into the playing of this. It's like all right, now it's time to play Serenade Do a Cuckoo. Yeah, Mick Abrams sounds bored on the guitar. Yeah, yeah, even and and some of it is I think can be attributed to the fact that it is. I mean, even in the Kirk uh, video, like it's a flute song, period. Totally. Oh, one hundred percent. You you just you just hear a little boom 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 in the back, not even that fast. Um, just a little flaky guitar and basically a cymbal keeping time, and that's it. Right. right. Um, and I, I think I think to go back to bringing it down tempo from from the the original, I think some of that ha- may have to do with the fact that. Because everybody else is playing so slowly, the speed that Anderson is playing sounds better. Right. Even though he's just playing almost just double time, it's still enough to to make it sound a little more uh, technically effective. One thing that I find is is really interesting with this is um, it is the cuckoo reference, and I you know I wonder what the inspiration was. Uh, for for Roland Kirk to create this piece, but um, the cuckoo, of course, is a is a blood parasite, meaning that it lays its eggs in the nests of other birds to so that they will expend the energy of raising the cuckoo, the baby cuckoo, and the adult cuckoo doesn't have to. Um, it's also a mimic and will mimic the sounds of other birds, which I think is a very fascinating double triple layer cake of meaning here that yeah. that uh ian anderson is mimicking the sound of another artist in a way um out playing a song which is about a mimic that's nice that's really cool um there is a a great degree of death for actual cuckoos though so i wonder where where <laughs> where that would fit in to this um analogy you mean of the baby cuckoos no of the the baby the other baby birds oh they kill yes yeah yeah, they the 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 baby cuckoo has a, a a little divot in its back that makes it easier to to catch the other baby bird and just push it back over the edge of the, uh, the nest just to fling it off into the wilderness. That's right. Apparently, the the mother will actually imitate the sound of uh of a particular sparrow hawk, which is known to feed on the favorite species that the cuckoo. A, um, a, is a parasite for uh-huh. so so that that bird will will not come back to the nest while the while the mother cuckoo is laying her eggs. Wow, yeah, that's fascinating. They are devious, and there are a bunch of different species of cuckoo that all parasitize specific birds. Oh, I didn't realize that. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's bonkers. Oh, it's interesting. So yeah, they're specifically paired with another species. Yeah. Oh yeah, they're 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 really all very well. Um, well developed right to do that one thing right for a variety yeah there i saw um an attenborough thing about about cuckoos i I watched at some point and it's just it's bonkers it's so crazy davy atts love him old old davy atts yep i mean i think and i think that you know we can there's a there's certainly an intersection here with the with the it's worth acknowledging that this is in some ways part of the long history of of uh white artists co-opting the techniques and styles of of uh black artists yeah. and other minority artists and and profiting off of it and i think that in a way you know the success of tall is is to a certain extent based on um you know the 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 passion and the hard work of of certainly directly roland kirk and um you know obviously this is a blues album and mm-hmm. Blues was not invented in London. Yeah. By a bunch of white guys. Yeah. I mean it's it's not that Serenade to a Cuckoo was like what shot them to stardom. No, no, certainly not. Still on an album that that sold copies, you know. And and the 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 mimicry, the cuckoo nature of of Anderson's flute playing, at least at least to begin with. And and you know, I I, I don't think it's fair to say that that he's strictly a mimic of another artist's style. I mean, he really does develop his own unique voice on the flute. Yeah. But certainly it's, it's clear with this album, what inspired him was, you know, even, even some of the specific 
flutter tongue techniques and and voice techniques. Yeah, that vocalization is 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 definitely there on 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 uh both this this track and Kirk's. Right. And frankly, Kirk does it way better, and it's way more of like a real technique that he's clearly developed over years and years and years. And this is like twenty one year old Anderson having come down from Scotland and saw a flute that he fancied, trying something out. And mimicking. And mimicking. Straight up mimicking, yeah. Laying his egg yeah in the nest of american jazz flautists yeah it's uh it was a it was a bad <laughs> epidemic for a while um i did i did read a story that um there was one i think one concert where both kirk and tall played mm. and they pulled kirk on stage to do cuckoo and he thanked them for exposing him to a, a younger generation that he had never been exposed to Wow, interesting. And there was there was a modicum of 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 success after that. Not like he blew back up, but like I mean, people were aware of him. And that's true. I mean, like, you know, this we can we can talk about the morals of it, but it's it's true, you know, I wouldn't know about Roland Kirk. And I, you know, as a as a as an ex flautist, there's a dark period in my life. We don't want to talk about it. Um, you know, but you know, I would have never, I would have never have heard of Roland Kirk if I hadn't been exposed to Ian Anderson. So, so there is that. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, whose fault is that question mark? You know, like that, that, that we don't know who Roland Kirk is. Right. You or, know? I mean, is it, is it just a fact that, that Kirk was playing in a, um, in a style which is less mainstream than rock and roll. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. In a very, it was very compartmentalized that generation before tall distribution of music was significantly less and like music like really exploded in the sixties and seventies. Right. Know? Right. Which probably had to do with things, record players and <laughs> like the radio and things like that being radio being more, I I know it was, but it was, it was a lot, um, it was a lot harder to, to get your stuff out there. Sure. Yes. Yes. I wonder, it'd be interesting to look at, you know, the number of studios that were available and just the, the amount of exposure that you could get. Sure. Making a recording in this time versus, you know, maybe even just 10 years before. Yeah. And, and, you know, like we've talked about on some of the previous episodes, this was a 1968 was a, a very a year of a lot of social upheaval and a lot of, a lot of culture and a lot of innovation. And so people were um, passing a lot of passing stuff around at parties. And I don't just mean records. Yay! I, I don't, I don't know. I'll edit that out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there, there was a younger rock and roll car- culture growing at this time and a um yes. a counterculture growing at this time i mean Absolutely. it's 68 so yeah there's more um it's not just you grow up with your parents you get a job and you move out and get your own house like there there was a certain degree of i belong to this other group well and 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 i think that anderson's generation st- seeking an identity and trying to create actively trying to create a new identity. I think that that's that energy is partly what gives rise to all this innovation and all these, all these different techniques and styles being, being blended together. And yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Creating a group nowadays has to be super distinct and different from everyone else. Back then you could pull things together, qualities that you liked because there there were so few groups hmm. cultural cultural and uh socioeconomic groups hmm. yeah plus the internet also the internet yeah but it's interesting you know i i do think that because of because you know you couldn't just put your stuff on soundcloud i think that that almost gave you a, it that gave bands a chance we're speculating here, I think, to a certain extent, but I think there was more of a chance to develop something unique. Because you wouldn't have literally every song ever recorded at your fingertips at, at every moment. You know, you might have, you know, who knows how Ian Anderson got exposed to Roland Kirk. 
Yeah, that's valid. But it's not like you could just go on YouTube. You might, maybe you had, you know, maybe, maybe you had your hands on one record, 12 songs, and that was it. Yeah, right, right. That was your total exposure to an artist. Yeah. So you're saying that, that they had to create more from whole cloth as opposed to be absolutely uh, more heavily influenced and take bits and pieces from this artist and this artist and this artist. Well, I think that, you know, I feel like now music is, is, is really formulaic. Hmm. Sure. And I think that this is less so. I think that they were, they were, they were creating a new formula because they were, there was so much real exploration and real searching. Sure. Yeah, but there there was no formula. It's not just that they were they were uh, saying no to the formula. The formula wasn't there. Right. Yeah. Um, just a just a little just a little note about the guitar part in this. There's a little there's a little there's one riff that has overtones of the Doors for me. Mm, interesting. It, it's it's cool to hear you know just that little bit of Mick Abrams coming out in this. Um, in this song and the couple of riffs where he's able to make a, make a statement or two. Yeah. I get a little bit more of the feeling from my Sunday feeling that, that with that baseline, uh, the pink Panther, a little looking back at Henry Mancini's pink Panther, that boom, boom, boom. Right. Um, which I mean, it's, it's, it's jazzy. So it's, it, it, it works, you know, and, and it's, unless you're, you're going ham on the bass, it's, it's, it's all going to have kind of, the same general feel to it so um unless you're like flea from from red hot chili peppers (laughs) so we were just talking about uh serenade to a cuckoo serenade to roland kirk to roland kirkoo (laughs) Um, and uh let's see what are we coming back to next week we are going to talk tall to you about dharma for one Ooh, the old clag clag oh thank you yeah yeah i I always i always sing the clag horn part when we go to karaoke Thanks again for listening to Talk Tall to Me, a Feckless Momes Audio Network production. Your hosts are Omen Said and Nick McGill, produced by Nick McGill.